Welcome to the Business Excellence for Managers podcast, which is dedicated for all of you leaders and executives who would like to continuously improve your business performance. This podcast is sponsored by Wave Business Excellence Footprint, the digital training company that cares about your development, your employees' development, and your business performance. You can find all the online courses at www.wave-bef.com. Today's episode is all about lean, continuous improvement, and much more. Mark Graben is an internationally recognized consultant, author, professional speaker, podcaster, and entrepreneur. He builds upon a deep education in engineering and management with practical experience working in multiple industries to apply methods including lean management, continuous improvement, statistical methods, and people-centered leadership approaches. He has learned, practiced, and taught these methodologies in settings including manufacturing, healthcare, and technology startups. Working independently since year 2010 and in partnership with other consulting groups, Mark enjoys working with organizations that are looking for better ways to improve, with leaders who are willing to lead that change. Mark is also a senior advisor to the software company Kinexus. He is the founder and lead blogger and podcaster at leanblog.org, which was started in January 2005. Mark is the author of the book called Lean Hospitals, Improving Quality, Patient Safety and Employee Engagement. And he also co-authored in the book called Healthcare Kaizen, Engaging Frontline Staff in Sustainable Continuous Improvements. Both books received the prestigious Shingo Research Award. Another successful book by Mark is titled Measures of Success, React Less, Lead Better, and Improve More. He has recently published a brand new book called The Mistakes That Make Us, Cultivating a Culture of Learning and Innovation. If you already heard a conversation with Mark in the First Waves podcast, then please note that this is the same recording because I find this content very helpful for you as a manager as well as for employees in the organization who are not yet managers. I'm excited to introduce you to this amazing guest, Mark. Hello, Mark, and welcome to the Business Excellence for Managers podcast. It's so great to have you here. Well, thanks, Juan. It's great to be here. I appreciate it. Thanks so much for your time. And I was looking at your trajectory of what you've done all these years, and it's very, very impressive. Therefore, my first question to you is, what would you say is your passion, and how did you get to where you are today? That's a big question, right? (laughs) I mean, you know, I started my career in manufacturing in the auto industry. I was working as an industrial engineer uh, at a General Motors plant. And I think even to this day, like just to summarize it, people shouldn't hate coming to work as simple as that. And, you know, there are other things that are important to me, like let's say safety and a belief that nobody should be hurt at work. You know, the risk or fear of injury might be one reason people hate coming to work. But I think more often people don't enjoy being at work because they're not being fully engaged. They're not being respected. They're not really being allowed to work to their full potential. They're being forced to struggle through um, situations that are just full of waste. So I think, you know, whether it's been manufacturing or healthcare or other settings, that same passion holds true. And I think the lean management methodology, thankfully, gives us a lot of uh, countermeasures to that. You know, better engagement, safer work environments. People can feel better about the work they do and feel better about themselves. So good. If I, if I really reflect on why have I been working with Lean so many years, that's probably one of the things as well. Because I remember when I was working in one of the companies at the beginning of my career, I was still a student in that company and there were so many processes that were broken and I was trying to do my best to do the perfect job, the perfect work, not to do any mistakes, but the process was set up so wrong Mm -hmm. that no matter what you did, you always somehow ended up doing some kind of wrong outputs for the customer. And the manager was just always putting us under pressure and we were trying to do our best. And later, 
when I was in another company and learning about all of these tools and techniques and learned about lean, I learned that just by changing the process, you can make the life of the employee so much easier. And, and I was like, okay, that's something I want to do for every employee out there in any company to make them happy at work and so that they can wake up in the morning and feel energized to go to work. Yeah. Therefore, we definitely share that passion. <laughs> I think there's one level, there's improving the process so that it's better for the people working in it. But better than that is engaging those people in improving their own work, right? So doing it in in collaboration with them is even more powerful. Exactly. Where they know that they can do the change. They do not have to always follow what managers say or what the team leaders say. And in some companies, I've had the opportunity to speak with a lot of those team leaders to say, it's not your responsibility to constantly come with the newest ideas on how to make the processes better. You need to work together with your team members. They are the ones who need to come up with the ideas because they are the ones who are working the process every single day and know what needs to be optimized and where. Mm -hmm. So that's, I think, for some managers, like a mindset shift because the managers think that they always have to tell the employees what to do and they're not Mm -hmm. used to it, that the employees are the ones who are going to give the suggestions. And once that's understood, then the whole environment and the whole culture gets so much better. Mm -hmm. So a lot of people think that lean comes from manufacturing, but for that, a lot of people fall into the habit of thinking, well, then I can only use it in manufacturing. I cannot use it anywhere else. And I was able to prove them wrong by using lean in finance world. And you were able to prove them wrong as well, that you use lean in so many other industries out there, especially also in healthcare, which is something that not many people have had the experience to roll it out like you did. Could you tell us more about that experience, how it was in healthcare? Yeah. I mean, you know, for one, manufacturing companies demonstrated first that functions outside of the factory floor can benefit from lean mindsets, lean methods. I mean, you're being very kind in describing my role in healthcare. I'm I'm not the one who started this in healthcare, and I'm certainly not the only one who convinced whoever of whatever, but I've played a role both through you know, the consulting work that I've done and as an author, hopefully I've been good influence in helping people convince themselves through some practice that these ideas do apply in healthcare. I mean, sometimes the idea of doing a small test of change was the best way for people to try lean on a small scale and figure out how they can adopt and adapt these methodologies for their environment. So even if I were to, quote unquote, convince somebody that this can work, they still have to go and prove that to themselves. And I I always encourage people, for what it's worth, to start small. Don't think about, if you will, transforming an entire organization. I think people throw that word transform around far too loosely. Like, let's try some improvement. Let's try some engagement. Let's solve problems that matter. And then once people can you know, build some confidence or some commitment or they build capabilities, then they can move forward and, and keep doing great things with Lean. You know, and those baby steps might involve starting with small projects or using some Lean tools, but the real potential from Lean comes from the layer that's really more about the management system and the culture. And some organizations, unfortunately, really don't ever attempt that. They're satisfied with using tools, training people, certifying people, doing some projects. That might be good, but it's maybe only scratching the surface of what lean really could lead to, whether that's in healthcare or other industries. That's so true. Especially if I think about what you said just now is so powerful that we do not want to have anybody feel overloaded with information if they say transformation because they think wow transformation means that we had to change everything here in the company we got to put it all belly up everybody has to do things differently and that's quite a scary scenario so that's why it's best just to do something small as you said yeah and give them just a little taste of what can these techniques and tools do for us And once they have seen that it really brings some value and it works for their business line or it works for their type of industry, then they can start testing more the waters. And the the good thing is that they have probably a nice lifetime with that methodology. They do not have to say after one or two years, it's over because they can go always a level deeper. They can always uh, improve their maturity level with the way how the lean culture works. 
for sure. Yeah, nobody ever runs out of improvement opportunities. Yeah. <laughs> it just does not happen. If if people are afraid of that, of like, you know, well, what happens when we're done improving everything? I'm like, you won't be. You just you won't be because even if you are really improving a lot of your existing processes, your organization is growing, evolving. There's probably going to be new products, new services, new opportunities for process improvement because even you know, if you're starting to do new things, things are never perfect to begin with. Yeah. And uh, maybe uh, Toyota hasn't run out of things <laughs> to improve after 70 plus years of focusing on the Toyota production system, which is generally the inspiration for what a lot of us would call lean. Exactly. Especially that customer expectations always change with time. So anytime mm -hmm. customer expectation shifts, then we already have an old process in our company because it's not anymore serving that new customer expectation. So we constantly have to adapt, adapt, adapt. And that's why I think that's also the great thing about our job, that it's, it's a never ending journey that you never can get to that perfect state because at the end of the day, you always have to adapt towards that customer expectation. Could you tell us an example of what you have seen in a hospital, a deployment in a hospital, because I think a lot of my listeners from the finance world, maybe they've also some from other industries, but not so many from the healthcare or from hospitals itself. Mm -hmm. Could you give us a little bit insight on how that experience was? Well, I mean, I'll, I can share a, a relatively recent opportunity that I had to work with an organization last year. I'm not saying it's the best example out there, but it's an example and, you know, and kind of speak to it. But there was an organization that brought me and a couple other consultants in because they were facing a real serious problem. So back to the idea of problem solving, like we're not coming in just to quote unquote implement or deploy anything, but we're, we're there to solve a problem that was really affecting surgeons and patients. And, you know, in a nutshell, that problem was that far too many cases were being delayed or even canceled because of surgical instruments that were missing, broken, presumed dirty, or not having been cleaned properly. And so there was problem statement, you know, there wasn't real precise data around how bad that problem was, but there were a lot of complaints from the surgeons, how these problems were disrupting their day. You know, the surgeons are being an advocate for the patients. You know, it's not good to have your procedure delayed for a lot of reasons. So we came in not to be the solution people or the problem solvers, but we put together a team of people from different departments at the hospital. You know, we're trying to break down some of these traditional silos and look at the end to end flow of what happens, you know, at the end of one procedure, when the, the instruments are done being used, they flow down to the basement where they're being processed and cleaned and reassembled and sterilized. And that flow back to the operating room, like studying the work. What are the causes of delay? Not because people aren't trying hard, but like systemic causes of poor flow, systemic causes of process problems, quality defects along the way. So over the course of a couple of months, there were some sub projects kind of defined within that overall flow, trying to prioritize what aspect of that overall problem needed to be addressed first. And you know, one of the measures was looking at the flow you know, the amount of time that it took instruments to go downstairs and get processed and brought back up. And, and there was something like a 70% reduction in that flow time, which was then, I don't have the numbers right in front of me, but it was cascading through then to solving that core problem about fewer procedures being postponed or, you know, being late, rescheduled. So, you know, it's the type of thing that was focused on the patients. It was to what you said earlier, Juan, of, you know, providing a better process that supports the people doing their amazing surgical work or surgical support work, better supporting them, but engaging some of them. You know, this comes back then to the questions of change management. People would much rather participate and um, they're, they're going to be more invested in a change they helped create compared to a change, even if correct, that was forced upon them. So I think that example is the type of work I like to do because it's focused on flow, safety, quality, making work easier for the employees doing the work. And, and then that leads to better financial performance for the hospital organization. So it really kind of checks all the boxes in terms of benefiting all of the people who are either the customer of the surgical work and the surgical processes, the patient, the people doing the work, it checks the box of, of being good for the organization as well. 
So it's not a win-win, it's a quadruple win yeah, <laughs> or more. more. <laughs> Depends on how we carve out how many stakeholders. But yeah, I mean, it's going to yeah. be good for everybody involved. You don't want to be yeah. sub-optimizing part of the value stream. You don't want to be pushing uh, waste someplace else. Um, that, yeah. that sometimes becomes a never-ending game of ping pong, if you will. Some of the key points, again, are engaging the people who do the work, giving them the time to study the current state, to come up with improvements and to go test those improvements and, and, and make sure others are being brought along, that they're being engaged, they're being trained, they're being coached and supported because you know changing the way we do work can be scary. So we can't just publish a new document and say, all right, there's the new way, yeah. go do it. It takes time to engage and bring people along properly. Especially if they've been doing it for so many years, the same process. Yet yeah, It's so automated the way people do things. And one has to be very creative. How are you going to set up the new standards? How are you going to train them to apply the new standards? And what kind of techniques can you use in, for them to realize, oh, wait, stop. I'm using the old standard. Let me really now go back and do it the new way, how we all decided, how we wanted to do it. Yeah, and I think that's really where a lot of innovative ideas can come together with the team members from, from that project. Yeah. Very good. When you do a couple of projects like those in the hospital, how do you maintain the sustainability of the lean program in that area? Especially that in hospitals, I've seen there's a lot of rotation of staff, maybe not the, the chief doctors, but more like in the nurses and the people who do the many little tiny steps in the process. And they are usually being rotated quite often. So that is something that probably needs to be standardized quite well in hospitals. How has that experience been for you? Well, I mean, it, it comes down to leadership, right? And, and there's a risk when leaders change that new leaders who come in might want to lead the way they used to or the way they're comfortable with or manage and oversee processes the way they're comfortable with. But I mean, it really comes down to leaders participating in you know, what you might call a management system, you know, kind of ongoing management system of how do we train people? How do we educate them? when they're new to the department? How do we make sure they understand the standardized work in this team, in this setting? So that requires ongoing effort. It's up to leaders to try to engage people, whether they're new or whether they've been there a while in ongoing continuous improvement or, or Kaizen. So that's where um, you know, my second book that I co-authored with Joe Schwartz called Healthcare Kaizen really emphasizes that of you know how do we keep the flow of improvement ideas coming and actually how do we keep the flow of problems and opportunities for improvement to be highlighted you know there's a topic that i've been able to study a lot in the last year and it's incorporated into my book the mistakes that make us like how do you make sure that there's a high level of psychological safety where people feel safe pointing out a problem admitting a mistake and then how do they feel safe speaking up with an idea that could make things better? Do they feel safe to be able to experiment or test their new idea in practice? There's a lot of pieces that really connect to ongoing management practice and culture, even within the team. But I think one other thing I would add to answer your question, I mean, the, the one way to tee up improvements for sustainment is to engage everybody from the beginning. I see times when you know, they're sort of you know, forcing change on people and then they ask the question of, well, how do we sustain this? I'm like, well, that's a little too late. <laughs> it's better to engage people early on in the definition and the understanding of the problem. I think only then do you earn the right to collaborate with people and engage them in trying to come up with, if you will, solutions and to test those. I mean, the sustainment can't be something that's tacked on at the very end. Like, I, I don't do a lot of work in the context of Six Sigma. But if the control phase of Six Sigma is equivalent to sustain, like that can't be tacked on as a fifth thing. That's got to be incorporated all throughout the improvement work. Even though this is a podcast, nobody can see me who are listening, but I've been nodding the whole time. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Yeah, I can really uh, resonate with all of that that you have said. And I just had a flashback of many, many years ago when I just became a project manager and I was sent to India to optimize some processes. And I was so shocked to see that the culture in India was quite uh, not the one how I was used to seeing in the company that I was working at because the employees were really scared to show any kind of mistakes that could have come up from their process because they were thinking if my manager sees that the mistake came from my workspace, then I will be out the door tomorrow because there are another hundred people waiting for my job outside. Right. 
And and that's exactly the opposite of anything that I learned about when I was thinking about the lead methodology. And for me to really explain to the manager to say that it's really good that we are finding these problems because only like that we'll be able to move forward. Of course, that's, I think, one of the main topics also from your newest book. And we will definitely get more into details in the next couple of minutes. Okay. Yeah, but you're, you're right. It's just on a comment real quick. And I think healthcare has a really bad habit as a profession or, or an industry, if you will, of blaming individuals for systemic problems. It's really unfair. It's counterproductive. I think as you're alluding to, it drives people, like instead of being able to use their creativity to understand the causes of the mistakes and to learn and improve and prevent future mistakes, it forces people to get more creative at hiding mistakes. And that, that's not really good for anybody. That's a survival tactic. And I'm not blaming people for hiding mistakes if they're going to get punished, but that's where leaders need to understand the impact of their behaviors and, and what that does to culture and people's feeling of safety or, or not. Exactly. And I think the environment defines a lot how an employee at the end is going to work. If you have a, an environment that is not promoting for the employee and not going to be making them feel good, then if, let's say, the shift is over at five o'clock, then they're going to just drop the pen and say, OK, it's five o'clock, I'm going home. But if you have an environment that encourages people to have a good time at work and that they can support each other, they have the empowerment, then even though they have still a bit of work, they're probably going to work a bit longer than five o'clock if they really need to, because they know that they are all here together as a team. Yes, well said. So if I look now at uh, some of the books that you've written, and it's really very impressive. So you have one book that's called Lean Hospitals, Improving Quality, Patient Safety, and Employee Engagement. And you also have another book that you've co-authored, which is called Healthcare Kaizen, mm -hmm. Engaging Frontline Staff in Sustainable Continuous Improvements. And for both of these books, you received the prestigious prize of the Shingo Award. Mm. Please tell us, how was the process to get that award? Because that's something very nice to obtain. Mm. Well, thank you. It was a great honor. Was really, really pleased to get that. And maybe even more so to win that together with Joe on our, our Healthcare Kaizen book. You know, so it's it's the Shingo Institute, of course. If, if people aren't familiar with them, I would encourage them to go check out the Shingo Institute at shingo.org on the web. They are part of Utah State University. The process has changed. Like I'm, I'm not an expert on that entire process. It used to be that a publisher could submit a book for nomination. You know, you this application and a fee that I think was part of that. And, and I think anybody could submit. My understanding is that in recent years, they've changed the process where a book has to be nominated by somebody within the Shingo Institute. They have, I think what they call their, their board of examiners that go out and visit and help assess organizations. They, you know, so it's, it's become a little bit more of a closed off process. I don't know. I don't know if that's good or, <laughs> or, or not. It's a change. They give that award to something like eight or 10 books a year. Wow. And so I guess if authors are listening and they have a book that they think is worthy of that Shingo award, I guess you have to plant the idea in someone's head of uh, please nominate me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Fantastic. Wow, that's pretty good. And, and it's interesting that you said that the process is not that transparent, not to see how this the nomination process or requirements actually look like, which is interesting, especially coming from a process, I would say, oriented organization like the Shingo Prize. But maybe it's meant to be that way. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, they do publish criteria, right? So, okay. I mean, I, I think what they don't give visibility to is, you know, what books have been nominated and don't receive that award, which I could understand. Yeah. So you hear exactly. when it's been announced. It's their award. So I figure that they can run it how they like. <laughs> anyway, I wanted to give you big congratulations on those two awards. <laughs> really fantastic. And you have another book that's titled Measures of Success, React Less, Lead Better, Improve More. Yeah, Very good. Sure. Yeah, there's the book cover <laughs> for those who we will have it then on our a video sequel that they can see the book cover. And uh, I love the looks of it, like a roller coaster. <laughs> Could you tell us more about this yeah. book? Well, so, you know, part of the idea is to help, if you will, get off the roller coaster, the proverbial <laughs> metrics roller coaster. The book, uh, again, it's titled Measures of Success. The subtitle, in a way, tries to summarize the book in six words. React less, lead better, improve more. Right. So I think organizations 
end up consuming or wasting a lot of time when they react to every single up and down in a performance measure of demanding explanations, root cause analysis. There's a wide range of reactions that could involve blaming and yelling at somebody. That's probably not helpful. But even trying to use lean methods of the metric is worse than it was last month. You know, Juan, I want you to lead an A3. And you say, okay, we're being lean. We're looking at the process. And there are lessons that come from statistics, you know, methods that date back more than a hundred years, which to me doesn't make them outdated. It makes them proven. It makes them yeah. tested, time tested. The yeah. math and the st statistics are still valid, but we need to understand basically when a data point or a set of data points is really worth reacting to. What's worth triggering a root cause analysis? And if some performance measure is just fluctuating around a stable average over time, I would say it's absolutely a waste of time to be chasing every up or down of getting upset, getting excited, getting upset again. But, you know, the methodology that I've learned and that I share in the book, it's called process behavior chart. It's a form of control chart. You plot your data, calculate and plot the average, and then more importantly, you calculate and plot what we call the lower and upper limits, below and above the average. And then we can use some really simple visual rules to tell us like, if there's a single data point outside those calculated limits that tells us, hey, whether it's good or bad, the system has changed like in a significant way. We need to make sure we understand what changed, where if it was something to the positive, we better understand what changed so we can help lock it in and then if, if things are for the worse, we, we definitely need to understand what changed so that we can put some corrective actions in place. So, you know, to me, that methodology is so helpful. You know, again, like when we waste less time reacting to every up and down, we can actually dedicate our limited time to problem solving and investigation where it's really most needed. And that, that leads to better results. It leads to more improvements. So that's, that's what the book Measures of Success is about. It's been out for about five years. Oh, wow. If I think back now during the times when I got my training two decades ago, I think there was probably a statistician called Walter Schuhart, and yes. he was the one who created those control limits. Yeah, and I think it's about plus or minus three standard deviations from the norm, from the process that you have. From his point of view, the ideal control points should be because if you are reacting, as you said, too quickly, then you will be always wasting a lot of resources, a lot of money, a lot of people on things that you do not really have to react on right. because it was just normal part of the process. It was the normal ups and downs that we had. And the same applies then for the lower control limit as well. Yeah, as you said, as we don't react if it's not really needed to. So that's where people and management should then understand how is the behavior of my process and to know the behavior of the process. You first have to measure it. Once you right. measure it, you got to look at the historical data and then you know, okay, what's normal and what's not normal. Yeah, this is really good stuff. I haven't read your book yet, but I'm definitely going to put it on my list. <laughs> it's available now, paperback, Kindle, you know, the new book just being released, uh, Measures of Success is still selling. Yeah. You know, I, I always love hearing stories from people who have not just read the book, but put these different methods to use. Yeah, exactly. Very good. And there's a, a further book that you've written, which is called Practicing Lean, Learning How to Learn to Get Better. Better. <laughs> Hold that one up too. Here we go. Yeah. Thank you. Wow. That's another good one. Could you give us a little more uh, information about that book? Yeah, so this is a project going back um, maybe about eight years ago. In a way, it's a precursor to the ideas from the mistakes that make us. So, you know, Practicing Lean is really about how I and then 15 other authors basically all wrote a chapter kind of sharing stories from early in our own careers, early in our own, if you will, practice of lean. This idea that, you know, a couple ideas I think are key. One is remembering, you know, when we're new to something, it's natural that we're going to make mistakes, especially if we're doing our best to apply what we've read somewhere. If we're trying to apply it in a workplace where we don't have a coach overseeing us and helping us out. And sometimes we learn through the mistakes we make. And you know, when we make a mistake, hopefully we learn in a way that we don't repeat the mistake. We do want to prevent the, uh, the repeat of a mistake. And so I think the 16 of us sharing those stories, hopefully you'll remind people, including reminding myself, like don't be too critical. Don't be unfair to people who are new to lean or to Six Sigma. And you know, hopefully it provides some encouragement to others you know, to not feel bad about themselves. 
if they struggle or do something that they think is a mistake. Again, just trying to encourage the acknowledgement, the admission, the um, sharing, the learning from the mistake. You know, I think that's what we're trying to get across in the book, Practicing Lean. Magnificent. Yeah, that's that's really good. And, and I think it really gives people more confidence for the whole methodology and more confidence in knowing that not everybody needs to know everything that you can just have or you can adopt the continuous improvement mindset, not only on processes, but also on yourself mm -hmm. as a person, as an individual, learning all these new tools and techniques. And we are all not perfect. And it's okay that we do not know everything today. And uh, we just have to try to be better every single day. And that's yes. why I think that's a really good message from that book mm -hmm. as well. Thank you. Your recent book, I think it just came out a couple of weeks ago, and that one is called The Mistakes That Make Us, yes. Cultivating a Culture of Learning and Innovation. Could you give us some more information on that book? Yeah, a new book that's in a way born from a podcast series that I started hosting September 2020 called My Favorite Mistake, where <laughs> guests come on and similar to what we did in the book Practice and Lean, you know, the idea is, you know, really successful people come on and share a story about a mistake that they made in their career. And, you know, I ask each guest to tell the story of what, what's your favorite mistake? Like, it's a very subjective question, right? Of how do we decide something was a mistake? How do we decide if something was a favorite? But I think, you know, a favorite mistake is generally, you know, a mistake that was big enough that we remember it prompted some sort of growth or learning or again, like, let's prevent repeating the mistake. And so the book was really kind of born from the podcast. And at first I thought, well, I'm going to just share a bunch of the stories from my podcast guests. And then I realized, for one, that book would have been really big. And at some point I had to sort of pick and choose some stories and share some ideas that really are in, in my own voice. You know, it draws upon stories from the podcast guests to help illustrate some of the points around how, you know, not, not just how do we improve, um, how do we learn from mistakes as individuals, but I think the more important question is, you know, how do leaders cultivate, almost said create, there was an evolution in the subtitle of the book, cultivating this culture where people feel safe to learn and improve, to learn and innovate because they're not being shamed or punished for mistakes, especially when they're trying to do something innovative. And, you know, there's certain types of process mistakes especially when they would cause a safety problem for employees or customers or patients, we should absolutely be trying to prevent certain mistakes. But then when mistakes still occur, you know, I try to make the case that this punitive blaming reaction is counterproductive. So we try to prevent mistakes, realizing they're probably still going to happen. <laughs> and then when they do, let's make sure the focus is on learning instead of punishment. Yeah, correct. And especially I've seen a statistic somewhere that. 80% of the time that the mistakes that happen is actually because it's process related and not person related. So it's mm -hmm. not because the person was not paying attention or that the person was not focused or because they were not skilled enough. It was mainly because the process was not just set up properly. And no matter who would have been in that position, they would have probably made very similar mistakes as well. Yeah. So that's something that I think it's also a very powerful message for a lot of people to know that even though mistakes do happen and human error does happen, that this person should not be I would say penalized because of that because we then can together as a team with the manager with that person and with the team members try to find out a good solution to say okay if this human error happens what can change in the process so that it will be more robust so that maybe the human error can be reduced right. yeah that the risk is reduced yeah yeah I mean and it's probably more than 80 percent we can't yeah. really ever know for sure what percentage of mistakes are caused by systemic factors now even if you point to you know human error and causes of that and you know human frailty uh, people get fatigued well we need to make sure we design processes that take that into account in terms of giving people proper rest or breaks or job rotation you know if the issue is mental fatigue i hear sometimes people talk about human error being the cause of mistakes they almost kind of throw up their hands and say like well we're all human we all make mistakes what can we do i'm like do something improve the system <laughs> improve the way it's designed, improve the way it's managed. Yeah. Don't just shrug and you know, it might be better than the punitive blaming approach. But I think there's this other reaction where people say like, well, what can we do? That's the question. That's not the end of the discussion. Exactly. That's where actually the discussion starts and not where yeah. it ends. 
Yeah. And there is a very good technique that I always enjoy doing in the workshops. It was uh, called Pokayoki, mm -hmm. which is the uh, mistake proofing technique where we will then identify those places in the process where usually human error happens and then try to find ways, as you said, yeah, to make it almost impossible that that human error can happen. Yeah, For mm -hmm. example, if we think about anything that's around us, yeah, like filling up our car with fuel. Mm -hmm. And some people made a mistake in the past of putting maybe the leaded or unleaded into the wrong car. So they said, well, let's make a poker yoker principle that we just make the size of the pump a little bit different. And I still do not agree with the way how they standardize that today, right. because today it's a bigger pump size where the circular uh, right. shape is either bigger or smaller. So that means that only one type of vehicle is protected, but the right. other vehicle is not protected. So actually, the Pocayoka principle should be that in the gas pump for leaded or unleaded, one should be maybe triangular, the other yeah. one should be maybe square shape. Yeah, so like this, both cars will be protected that you don't put the wrong fuel in there. So these are the type of things that we can really right. then hinder in case you have the end user, which is the person working on that process. If somebody driving the car is sleepy or is a tourist who's renting the car and does not know the process 100% well, then the process is set up in such a way, having that triangular pump or a square pump, that it will always be the right way of gassing up of the car. And yeah. similar, I think, can be done in businesses as well, that they can see exactly where is the mistake happening and how can we structure it so that the mistake will not happen again. That's a, really, that's a really good point. And I made a mistake about how I thought about this for the longest time because I assumed, and it turns out it was a mistake, assumptions are the cause of a lot of mistakes, that if you were going to choose one of those two directions in which to error-proof it, that you would choose to error-proof the more harmful mistake. So you can't fit the diesel nozzle into an unleaded fuel tank. You can put unleaded gas into a diesel. You know, doing that would actually pretty quickly destroy the diesel engine. But I looked this up and, and, and there's this long history of, originally the mistake proofing was about leaded and unleaded fuel. Diesel wasn't part of that equation uh, at all. And they were mistake proofing so you couldn't put leaded fuel into an unleaded vehicle. I think I have yeah. that right. But then the diesel nozzles were chosen to be the same size as the old leaded ones, I believe. That's the history there, but you're right. That's I mean, right. it's it's not a perfectly designed system and it's just a matter of time where somebody rents a diesel vehicle or let's say if you're a company with a fleet of vehicles where there's some that are unleaded and some that are diesel, I would guarantee it's just a matter of time before somebody puts unleaded fuel into one of your diesel trucks. Yeah. Now you can try to have all kinds of different procedures to make that less likely to occur. But like, you know, I think the warning sticker on the tank, you know, people would probably very easily overlook that. So we have to be careful if we're just relying on, you know, stickers or signs that say, be careful. Exactly. It might help, but it's not going to be fully effective. That's right. So that, that's where you have like those different levels of standardization. So you say, is it more a warning type where you just have like a little sticker saying, be careful, this could happen if you do this? Or is it something that's going to really prevent? So it's going to like stop the process that you cannot proceed if you do not do it the right way. For example, let's say you're going to buy something online and you would like to put your address, but by mistake, you type the wrong street name and then mm. it will detect that that street does not really exist. And it will then ask you, sorry, you cannot continue here with your purchase because you need to verify your street name. Then you can say, OK, I cannot continue. I need to look again that I have the right street in there. And that's again, you know, you're, you're really like bulletproofing that whole process so that the human error can be detected and you can then correct it before the output goes out there. Yeah. Yes, yeah. for sure. Yeah, and, and that it's magical when you can do workshops with people who are working in processes that you do not know, but you see all these ideas just popping up from these people, yeah, all these creative ideas. And that's why I think innovation is so close to process improvement, because in order to improve your process, you need to be extremely innovative as the user of that process. I think in one of your books, you've also mentioned about the topic innovation. How do you combine the innovation topic with process improvement? Well, I mean, I think there's kind of a spectrum between process improvement and innovation. I mean, I think of innovation is in terms of, you know, creating something that didn't exist before. But a lot of innovations are really built upon incremental improvements yeah. of other things. So, you know, we kind of get to explore this in the book and uh, in the mistakes that make us iterative improvement and iterative innovation. In a way, you have to make it safe for people to fail. 
if you will, to try something that didn't work as we expected, but then learn from it and progress and adjust and, and move forward. There's different letters people use, either PDCA, plan, do, check, act, or I prefer PDSA, plan, do, study, adjust. You know, I think uh, a lot of uh, improvement and innovation is really kind of built around that same iterative mindset. It requires psychological safety, yeah. right? Because if people are going to get punished for trying something that didn't work out, they're either going to be pressured into, let's say, falsifying data to make it look like it was really better, um, or they're just going to be really cautious. And if you're only trying things that are guaranteed to work, that's not where innovation comes from. So true. The thing I really enjoy about your book is that it's giving the people the safety at work to know we have the right to make a mistake because with each mistake that we do, we are actually getting one step closer to the solution of what we need to achieve for that optimal process output. So yeah. just as an example, if you have 10 different ways of doing the process wrong and you have one way to do it right, so if you did two, three mistakes of, of selecting the wrong one, then you just have a couple more you can test until you get the right one. Mm. It's really very, very important that people know that it's not a failure if you're doing the mistake. It's actually a win. I think we need to turn it into a win. And, yeah. and that comes back to how do leaders react? Yeah. How do we react and, and, and what do we do next? Yeah. So I got two more questions. One of the questions, because a lot of listeners, they are doers and they like to end a specific episode with some actionable things that they would like to try out. So could you give us a quick takeaway or a simple learning nugget or a tool that they could apply today in their workspace to be more efficient? Well, I share this in the book, like a, a way of thinking through a mistake or even like how to reflect on an attempt at improvement is, you know, to kind of step back and as we're evaluating what happened as we're studying as part of that PDSA cycle, just to ask, you know, what did we expect to happen? What actually happened? If there's a gap, do we understand the cause of that gap? Um, what are we going to do differently next time? What do we predict is going to happen? and then go and do that next phase of the experiment. So I think the more quantified that you can get, the better in terms of kind of understanding this difference between here's the results we thought we were gonna get. Maybe we got results that were a little bit lower. Like, do we call that a failure? Maybe not, that's subjective. But I think kind of understanding that gap and you know, we can go back and ask, were there certain assumptions that we made that turned out not to be true? Did we make an improvement, but maybe some other factor came into play that was either new or something we didn't understand or didn't anticipate? So I think, you know, it's just that simple list of questions, yeah. you know, is something that people could use and apply. And I think it's helpful. Fantastic. And I think being again that child to ask a lot of questions, that's really, I think, a very, very good start. <laughs> yeah. Great. So I'm very curious. You have written so many fantastic books. How long does it, in average, take you to start and finish a book? What would you say was your rough estimate? It's roughly a year, nine to 12 months. Wow. And part of that is, you know, the book writing has never been a full-time job, yeah. right? So it's the type of thing that I can do when I have time or when I can make time. Weekends, sometimes in the evenings, you know, sometimes I'm able to take days off and carve out time or carve out half a day. Yeah to work on the book, what I found doesn't work is saying like, oh, I've got 30 minutes here, 45 minutes there. I'm like, well, <laughs> you need to kind of get yourself into book mode and get yourself into some sort of flow. Yeah. Um, so it's possible, maybe on the future, I could do it faster, but sometimes it takes <laughs> as long as it's going to take. That's right. Okay, good to know, because I'm writing a book right now. That's why I was very curious <laughs> to see your experience, especially that I'm just at the beginning of my book writing, and then I at least know more or less what's ahead of me. And I'm also planning around about one to one and a half year to write the book. Mm -hmm. So yeah, thanks a lot for sure, all that input that you gave us today, Mark. And before we finalize, could you tell the listeners what are your services and where can they find you? Uh, well, thank you. Yeah, I mean, uh, people can come to my website, markgraben.com, where they can find me on LinkedIn. My name is unique enough where I'm pretty easy to find online, thankfully. I do a number of things with organizations that involves either speaking engagements or let's say leadership team events or, or company retreats. Some of that often turns in, into coaching, you know, beyond just that one-off opportunity to come in and speak. You know, I also have different workshops that I run related to continuous improvement, related to the book Measures of Success, 
the statistical methods. Those are just a couple of the things that I do. And you know, I work with a lot of healthcare organizations, but I also work with companies in other industries. So those are just a few of the things that I do. And then you know, I publish books and I do podcasts and <laughs> encourage people to check those out as well. Fantastic. Excellent. I'll be putting all of that into the show notes. So again, Mark, it was a fantastic uh, conversation. Thank you so much. Thank you. And I'm looking forward to seeing more books from your side someday. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Juan. Thank you. Bye-bye. I hope you enjoyed this conversation with Mark. In the show notes, you will find all the links on where to find and contact him. As we learned, the lean methodology can be used in almost any industry and it is a key business driver when implemented correctly in the organization. It will also be one of the few methods out there that can change company culture. If you are interested in learning more about lean, I have various courses that are designed for you as a manager. We can either learn more through a basic course called Lean Six Sigma Yellow Belt Training or you could take a more extensive manager certification program called Lean Six Sigma for Managers where you can even obtain a lean certification by going through a one to two year program. The investment in the certification program has proven to be more than tenfold the benefits which is 100% measurable. I have placed the links to those courses in the show notes. I hope you found this episode valuable. Please rate, subscribe, send in your comments and share with those who you think could profit from this episode. It's very much appreciated and I'm grateful for your messages. I am also a work in progress and strive to do things better every day. This podcast was sponsored by Wave Business Excellence Footprint, where we believe that investing in yourself and in your employees is the best investment. Therefore, if you are interested in finding out more about courses and certification programs that were designed for you as a manager to further boost your business excellence initiative, then please go to Courses for Managers tab in the company website www.wave-bef.com where we have interesting courses for you as a leader. On the other hand, if you want to further develop your team members and your high performers so that they can bring even more value by learning new skills and methods for solving process issues, then please select Courses for Employees tab on our website. Here you will find impactful courses designed for your employees. In case you already have team members who are certified in any of the Lean Six Sigma levels, then we have additional courses for them as well. Thank you, stay tuned and see you in the next episode of Business Excellence for Managers.